Thanks. Okay, so I'll be talking about developing scientific software in Python. So what is Geoscience Australia? It's a government agency and there's a photograph of it there. And we do a lot of things such as producing maps and doing um, pre-competitive mineral exploration. The area that I work in is doing, is, it's modelling risks from natural hazards. So things like inundation or storm surges or looking at risk to Australia due to um, earthquakes. So two of the models that I've worked on are an inundation model called Anuga and also an earthquake model called EKRM. So these, there's a lot of similarity, like obviously they're modelling different hazards but there's a lot of similarities between the underlying um, code itself. So both models are open source and both models are written in Python with sections of the models written in C. Both models have also been parallelized, so they run on um, uh, Linux clusters. And the, both models, they don't have any graphical user interface. So you write a Python, uh, Python script to run these models. Oops. Okay, so you might wonder why would a scientific organization be using, be using Python, especially if we're doing simulations? Because simulations, they're um, time intensive, and but Python's an interpreted language. I've got a photo there of um, a happy looking scientist. So, <laughs> what makes scientists happy? It's when they can come up with an idea and they can get that, and if they're working with simulation software, where they can get that idea implemented and get the results quickly. So even though the actual program might run a bit slower because it's not written in Fortran or C, it's actually easy to code in. And also, it's, there are like a lot of software developers at Geoscience Australia, but also there's a lot of the scientists who are actually write, writing code. So because it's easy to code in, and all the things that we love about Python, the scientists love as well. There's good documentation. Also, there's a lot of packages that are scientific packages, so it's got the building blocks, that they, building blocks that they can use to get results quickly. Also, there's no license management with Python, as you know. So another um, scientific software called MATLAB, that does require licenses and that can be a bit of a hassle. Okay, here's, here's an example, or this is output that Geoscience Australia has produced. So what this is showing is the annual loss um, due to earthquakes as a percentage of total suburban value for suburbs in the Perth region. So it's complex output and to get something like this there's a lot of complex steps like we have to develop a set of synthetic earthquakes representing like the earthquakes over a 500 year period for example and we have to work out the ground shaking and all the houses due to those earthquakes then we have to work out the damage to each of the house and then how much each of that, what that damage would cost and then aggregate all that information. So we get and we produce something like this. So say with this result, if this area here was instead of being that yellow colour, was maybe that brown colour. Okay, the scientists that um, produced, uh, who came up with the models that produced this output, if this area here is brown, and they look at this output, they're not going to know, or I don't think there's anybody in the world who would be able to look at this, re this result and say, this isn't right, there's a bug in the code. So as a software developer, it's, it's a bit of a problem if you can write something and they can get output, and you can't actually tell that the output is, um, or that there's a problem in the output. So the quality assurance of the end product is difficult to impossible, um, depending on the complexity of the output. So what, what do we, but obviously we want to produce output that we believe is correct. So what can we, what steps do we take to make sure that the quality or the quality of the code is high? And so I'll be talking a bit about that. So I think the foundation for it is um, having good unit tests. 
So with, and I'm sort of, I'm going to assume that you know about unit tests, but I'll talk about what makes a good unit test. So you want unit tests that can isolate problems. And so when your unit tests fail, you want to be able to quickly understand why that unit test is failing. So you want it to just cover a small section of code. Unit tests can also be good for um, sort of augmenting or explaining functions. So you've got the comments. Good unit tests can also help in understanding what code should be doing by seeing what, what the input can be and what the output should be. Also, unit tests should run fast. So you want developers, when they um, refactor code or when, they, when they're adding new sections of code, you want them to be running your unit test continuously. So you want the, the unit test to be able to run quickly so they'll run it more often, so they'll be able to find out if they've broken sections of the code quicker. And also you want all your unit tests to be automated. So you want to be able to just run one command and all your um, unit tests will run. Okay, so this is a sort of, it's a fake example, but it's an example of a good unit test. So you've got some comments there saying what you think you're testing, and you've got input and output. So if, if a function or if a unit test breaks, like a lot of times you're wondering, well, is it the unit test or is it the code? If, you've, if things are basic and understandable in the unit test, then at least you know, okay, this unit test seems correct. So this is an example of the same function being tested. So the input and output, like it's still correct, but it's just harder to understand what's actually happening. Okay, this is an example of an actual unit test that isn't so good. So um, I knew there was an error in this code somewhere. The error turned out to be in this module down the bottom. This was the only unit test which executed that module. Um, so this unit test is not isolating the problem. This is the, that's the input that went into the unit test and that's the output. So you look at that and you don't really know, like you cannot tell what B actually should be doing. And also it doesn't give you, um, it doesn't give you faith either as well that, that any of this code is correct. So um, okay, so that's an example of a bad unit test. Now I'll move on to other sort of areas. So I said before the, um, the code that we have it's, it doesn't have a graphical user interface, so the output is, um, is a file. So it's what we found to be good in catching um, bugs or keeping the quality control up is being able to visualize the output. So let me see. Okay, so one of our, one of the codes that we write, it's an inundation um, modeling. So this is output from the inundation modeling. So it's, it, it helps that it's simulating water and we sort of know what water should look like. So if there's anything drastically wrong, then you can tell it straight away. I mean, I've seen sort of water traveling up walls and water just sort of suddenly appearing in land and disappearing. So visualizing, can be really, visualizing the output can be really helpful in catching errors. Oh yeah, also, with, with this code itself, it's a numerical methods code, so the water is represented by triangles, with each triangle sort of knowing the height of the water. Okay, so for the earthquake model, it's not quite as interesting, you don't, the output isn't movies, but there's a um, package such as matplotlib, which is really good for graphing the output and producing maps. Okay, how else can we maintain the quality of the code? For the um, inundation model, we can actually validate it against real life, real life water, I suppose. Like, so this is a dam break tank. So there are sensors measuring the water height and the um, velocity of the water. 
So we can then simulate this tank and we can get results. So the black line is um, the results from Manuga and the coloured lines are the actual results from the water tank. So we've got several um, validation data sets that we, that we um, code up into, into a system test that it takes a while to run, maybe 20 minutes, but you can run that whenever you want to make sure that the quality of, um, or that the results you're getting from the inundation model aren't changing. And we did this sort of thing, or we automated it all, because we would run tests like this and we'd say, excellent, we're getting really good results. But then six months later when we, um, we'd run the test again, it was, and it wasn't getting the same result. So by having this automated so you can run it often, it's really useful maintaining the quality of the code. For earthquakes though, or for the earthquake code, we don't have good earthquake validation data. So what can you do in that sort of case? What we do is um, we've, we create input, okay, we run it, o EcoRAM overall, given some input data, that's gonna give some output. We don't know if that output is correct, but the first time we run or create these tests, we can assume the output is correct and we'll call it standard out. Then in the future, when we refactor the code, we can, we can run these tests. So it's checking current behavior against the behavior when the test is written. And so this is, this is useful when you're refactoring or just yeah, doing changes to make sure that it's still okay. So for example, when EcoRAM initially, we were just running it on Windows, then we moved it over to Linux. The unit, I got to a point where all the unit tests were passing, but these tests were failing. So then it's working out, okay, why? And so that, that sort of error wouldn't have been caught unless they had these overall system tests, because a lot of things um, aren't caught by unit tests. Obviously, all the integration between all the code. So for EcoRAM, we've got 53 um, characterization tests. Oh yeah, characterization tests, they can also be good um, with legacy code. So say you get some legacy code, people, are, people say we're happy with what it's doing, but we want to add new functionality. So you want to add that new functionality without breaking it. So you do use characterization tests to make sure that you're, that you're keeping the current functionality and you don't really have to know what the specifications of the code are. Okay, yeah, so we're doing all this. So these tests mean that it's easier to refactor the code. So what sort of, okay, I'll give a sort of example of some of the refactoring that we did. For the um, inundation model, we developed it iteratively. Initially it was written all in Python and it had a, a lot of instances. So you saw before how the sort of the building blocks for the inundation code are triangles in a mesh. So initially the there was a triangle object and there'll be eight triangle instances to represent what's shown up there. Once the overall architecture of the code was stable, then we focused on optimization. And so one of the things that we did was reduce the number of instances. So we have, we've got a mesh object and so there's one instance of that and that represents many triangles. The information um, associated with the triangle, such as water height and momentum in, in the X and Y direction, that information is put into NumPy arrays. And we also did profiling and the bottleneck sections we'd write in C. And so by doing things like that, you made the, co the code become a lot faster and a lot memory intensive, which meant we could run bigger simulations, which is what the scientists want. Okay, so if you're gonna do, so now I'll talk a bit more about speeding up the code. So if you wanna do any sort of um, optimization of your code, then use profiling. Often where you think your code's gonna be slow, it isn't slow. 
profiling can, can tell you where it is actually slow. Once you find the slow bits, often it can be sped up by using better algorithms. Um, so there might actually be, your code might have bugs in the sense that you're just using algorithms that are really slow. Also by using NumPy, it can speed up your code. So I'll, be, I'll talk a bit more about that in the next few slides. You can also, the, often with um, numerical models, there's sections that it spends a lot of time in. These sections can be recoded into other languages or like C or Cython to speed things up. And so I've listed a few modules that can be used for profiling. It's also handy to do um, memory profiling. There's a package called Gumpy. One of the things with Gumpy though, if you've got all your information in um, NumPy arrays, Gumpy doesn't actually sort of see that memory. Okay, so what's NumPy? It's a package that's used extensively um, in the scientific area and it's a way for, st uh, it's for storing and manipulating n-dimensional homogeneous array objects. So scientists like it, it because it can really speed things up and also reduce the memory for storing information. Obviously to get the speed benefits you have to um, use the NumPy data types and also the NumPy functions. So if you have a, a, an array, you want to find the minimum number in that array, you don't use a Python min call, you use the NumPy min call. Also you um, vectorize operations and I'll talk about that in my next slide. You can also compile, to get uh, maximum speed, you want to compile NumPy to your CPU. So there's another package as well that's used a lot, that's called SciPy. And that, that sort of extends the functionality of NumPy. It's got a lot of tools, scientific tools and engineering tools associated with it that um, use NumPy as a basis. Okay, so here we have an example. So these, these two codes, they both do exactly the same thing. And that's um, estimating a value of pi. The, the top yellow code, that's standard Python. So that x, the value of x there, it's just one number. What we've got down here, um, np is numpy. So when we run this code, the value of x there, it's not one value, but it's an, a one-dimensional array or a vector of values. So this doesn't actually have a loop in it. When this code is ran, the, the vast majority of the time is spent inside these um, NumPy functions, random, random, square, where, sum. So these functions, they're, um, they're written in C and they've been optimised for speed. And so that's why when you do the, the time comparison, this is when n is a million, this takes about a second, this takes about seven seconds, so you can get a good speed up. Okay, what are other ways of getting things faster? So you can parallelize the code. So um, in Python you can start threads. Due to the global interpreter lock, that um, sometimes that's not so good. If you've got if you, parallel, if you use threads and it's doing a lot of I.O., then you will get um, a speed up. But if it's like those codes that you saw before, then you won't. Python has a multi-processing package. And so that's useful for taking advantage of um, the cores on your, if you've got a, like, a box or a computer to um, run. And that'll execute Python on the like, startup multiple processes of Python. If you're using a cluster, so a bunch of computers that are connected by a fast network, MPI is the standard way of or standard way of parallelizing things. So MPI isn't part of Python. It's a sort of it's another package. In, oh, it's not a well. It's not part of Python, and it allows processes to communicate with one another by sending and receiving me receiving messages. So they're wrappers. Um, 
around MPI for Python. So when you're gonna, when you're gonna do this though, you have, to, you have to modify the code to take advantage of MPI and this can be, um, be quite a lot of work. And so this is how it's, this is how you use it. You do a command MPI run and this would run the code called parallel.py on four cores or processors. Okay, so here's an example of doing that sort of thing. Um, so for the inundation model, it's made up of um, triangles. Triangles are different sizes. When we ran this job on four um, processes, the area is partitioned into four areas. And so the, um, okay, the size of the area has been chosen so for it to be load balanced, this area that's got a large triangle, well this, so it'll have the same number of triangles, not necessarily the same area. And so when this runs, MPI is, um, or the commands in MPI are doing the subpartitioning, and they're also sort of ghost triangles around this edge and around this edge, and MPI is handling the communication between all these triangles. And so it's, so it's quite complex to parallelize code like this, or a model like this, I should say. Some, some models are easier to, to parallelize. So in what I showed you before, there was communication between the processes. For the earthquake model, it's what you call em embarrassingly parallel. So with the earthquake model, you're looking at the ground shaking um, for a set of locations. But the amount of ground shaking that happens over here isn't affected by the ground shaking that happens over here. So you can just cut the simulation up across four processes by giving subsets of the number of, or subsets of the houses. And so that's easy. Okay, so what sort of timings, or what sort of speed up can we get? So here's um, some results for the earthquake model. So when we're running on one process, it takes about an hour and a half. When we go down to 32 processes, it's taking about three minutes. But you can sort of see that this isn't such a good way of graphing up the speed up. Another way of looking at how, well, the speed up that you can achieve is looking at the parallel efficiency. efficiency. So with the parallel efficiency, if you're, um, if when you double the number of processes, the time it takes to execute is halved, then that's the parallel efficiency of one and that's, and that's really good. So you can see here how the parallel efficiency decreases and um, that's, that's pretty common and that's due to the communication, due to such things as the communication between the nodes and not all of the code being parallelizable or parallelized. Okay, so from this you can sort of tell that this, or the earthquake model, it's good for running like 40 processes, but it's not the sort of thing you'd run on a supercomputer with a thousand nodes. Okay, um, that's, that's the end of the talk. If you want, want to hear more about Python for Science, then Edward Schofield is doing um, some talks tomorrow about Python for Science and Engineering, and he'll, I'm sure he'll go into like NumPy and SciPy in more depth. So, yeah, is there any questions? Oh, and actually we've got a microphone as well, so. We do, yes. Um, uh, sorry, yeah, it's on. Oh, hi, uh, my name's Paul Leopardi, I'm from ANU. Um, you said mm -hmm. that uh, the Python was good because scientists like to write in it. So mm -hmm. the question is, um, Okay. Yeah, so the question is, um, how do you get scientists to do things like uh, documentation and unit testing and, uh, <laughs> and all that sort of stuff? Is there, is there some sort of team structure between the scientists and the IT people to make sure that all of that happens and that you have something that can be properly packaged? That is an excellent question. Um, I suppose... 
we and we don't have a good way of doing that. Like often, what happens is that I mean, I think it depends how the project started. Basically, if there there are some scientists who um, have also also are good software developers, so they are already doing that. And so often, if the system starts off like that, when more, when, when you have other scientists that join the team, then they're told how to do the development. But often when the, it's scientists starting up, they, yeah, we, you have the problem of them not doing unit tests, not documentating, not doing documentation. Um, version control, what's that? Subversion, yeah, they don't know what it is. So we face that problem as well. Like ideally, you'd I think it'd be, it, it, it's good if you have a software developers in the project, in the team, but often the scientific environment as well. Um, it's quite sort of silo based. You have a scientist, and it's not like every scientist is going to have a software developer associated with it. So yeah, it's a problem and I have no solution. <laughs> Thanks, Duncan, for an interesting talk and uh, a good overview. Um, Thanks. I'm interested in um, what problems you've encountered at GA using uh, Python for your science work. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, what problems? I think overall Python's a great language to use. I'd say some of the problems can be actually getting it installed and like getting just the packages up there, so it's, yeah, it's more the system administration sort of problems that we face. Um, I mean, there can be a bit of a, like people, MATLAB is a prominent scientific language that a, th a lot of people use in universities maybe, so that they'd want to stick with um, MATLAB, that's another bit of, bit of a problem. We'd want them to have a better understanding of um, running Unix as well, I suppose, and some people do. But overall, I mean, Python is a language. I think it's, yeah, it's a really simple language to learn. So the problems are things not to do with Python, really. Um, I actually had a couple of questions. Yep. Um, one was, I noticed you when you mentioned MPI, you mentioned um, three different MPI libraries. Yep. And one of the problems I think newbies have in Python is there's so many packages and you don't know which one is the most standard. So is one of those the you know more standard than the others or, or better in some way? Yeah. Well, I think MPI for Pi seems to be the more standard, the one more standard one used. We use PyPar, like one of the people um, that is sort of part of GA, he wrote that. So yeah, and that is a problem, I suppose. <laughs> As a generalization, Google and see which one seems more prominent. But yeah, it is an issue. And these things change as well. Like, you know, you go back, I don't know, seven years or five years, and there was um, numeric, which was used to do arrays. Now it's NumPy. So you might find you start using a package and then sort of realize, ah, it seems to be dying. <laughs> what are people using these days? Um, thank you. <laughs> so I also um, wanted to ask, a lot of the time um, cluster architectures nowadays are you have a cluster of multi-core nodes. Yep. Um, so you have shared memory mixed with um, distributed non-shared memory. Yep. Do you try to do anything in particular to take advantage of that architecture? No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, uh, thanks for the talk. I, I was just wondering, uh, what sort of architectural decisions would you have to make uh, if you want to design your code so that it can be parallelized later, but uh, without uh, parallelizing it to begin with? Um, okay, I mean, both of the codes, both with the inundation model and the earthquake model, they weren't parallelized initially. For I mean, I've mainly got experience with the scientific code, and a lot of, a lot of that, it's, there's big chunking arrays of data 
in the code. And so when you go to parallelize, it's, it's sort of how am I going to cut this up? Um, and so there isn't any architectural, there's not so much any architectural changes that you do when you, that, that we could have done at the beginning. Um, yeah, I mean, but there, there are changes that you do once you parallelize it, you can sort of, you realize oh, I, can, I can save in memory by sort of taking subsections of this array as well. And like for um, the inundation code, like we, because that was a, one that was a lot more complex to parallelize, we sort of contracted people from ANU to do that. Questions and we've got time for, so I suggest I'll just do one more question from the floor, and then if you've got questions, feel welcome to follow up with Duncan afterwards. Yep. Um, <clears throat> I have never used MPI before, yes. but um, just out of curiosity, uh, I guess you can run MPI on, on a single machine. Yes, you certainly can. Yeah. Yep. So, have you ever uh, compared the the performance of multi the multi process module? and the MPI, and uh, does it have a gain over the multi-process module? I have to make a confession as well. I haven't ever run multi-processing. I've just used MPI. So no, I haven't done that comparison. But I mean, if you're just running on a single box, I think the, the beauty of, of multi-processing is you can just in, like, import that package and start using it. With, um, the, with MPI, like those Python packages are really rapid, so you have to install MPI as well. Um, so I have a spectacular PyCon cup, or mug I should say. Thank you. Um, for Duncan, please um, show your appreciation.